Thank you for checking out Coastal Community Church. We hope that you receive hope and encouragement through this week's message. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your story at mystory@coastalcommunity.tv. We hope you enjoy the service. right? <laughs> kind of shocked me there a little bit. How are you guys doing this morning? Pompano, you guys doing well? <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, my name is TJ. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad that you're with us this morning. This is the late crew. These are the people that love to sleep in. I'm so thankful for people that like to sleep in. So you, you guys give me somebody to, to, to talk to here. And uh, I'm excited about next weekend. I, I know that Shayla just talked about it, but I'm, I'm telling you, this next series is going to be incredible. We have some really cool things planned for it. We're going to give you an update on some of our future, our seven-year anniversary free t-shirts. I mean, come on, free t-shirts. And uh, like, let me just tell you something. Like the t-shirts we give out aren't like those cardboard t-shirts that like feel nasty and stuff that are like the cheapest t-shirt on the face of the earth. We're talking like nice, soft, like form-fitting, like make you look good t-shirts. Like if I... It, uh, there's a rule, like, when we buy t-shirts, if I won't wear it, we're not buying it. So, like, if it's not a t-shirt that I, I would wear, then we're, we're not buying it. So, uh, man, be here next week. It'll be the only weekend we're giving out free t-shirts. So, if you miss it, you have some other plans, you better change, the, change those plans. That's all I got to say. Anyways, we're in this series run, and today is kind of the conclusion of, of this series. And we've been talking about the whole context of this series has been based on this, this thought uh, out of Scripture that, God has called every one of us to run a race. And throughout scripture, you see the parallel between your life and, and running a race. And God doesn't just want you to run in life. He wants you to run in such a way to win. And we've based this whole series off of a scripture out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, I, as I was thinking about this verse, we talked about the weights and the sin. We've talked about that aspect. We talked about like when we hit the wall in running, there's a lot of parallels between running races and, and God's word and the realities of our life. And, and we've hit a lot of different things. But I was thinking about this verse because there's one aspect that I think is really, really critical for every single one of us if we're going to run the race that God has set before us. And the problem for a lot of us is, is, is that we don't know what the finish line is for the race that God has set before us. Like for a lot of us, we're like, man, I'm all about running this race that God has for me, but I have no idea what that race is. Like that, that to me is a little bit of a problem. If you're going for a run and you don't know where you're going, that can be bad. And if you don't know what the destination is, then that can be a difficult thing. And so what I want to talk to you about today that I think is a great way to kind of tie this series up in a nice, neat little package is, is I want to talk to you guys today about 
the race that God has set before us. In other words, I want to talk to you about vision. I want to talk to you about your vision in particular for your life. And let me kind of define vision for you. Vision is simply a destination. It's simply a, a, a destination in your life. And I believe that God has got a destination or an end place. And, and that destination is, is there should be a picture of, of what that looks like for your life. I think that God gives you a destination or a picture of what your future marriage or your current marriage could and should be. I think that God can give you a picture of what your career is. He can give you the destination, the end goal of that. Same thing for your finances, same thing for your relationships. In every aspect of life, I believe that God has a, a destination for us. He has a, an end point. Like here is the, the thing that I want you to do or what I want it to look like and what I want you to accomplish. And vision is, is, is in essence uh, a this thing that's within us, it's this picture of what could be and should be for our lives. It's not just what could be, but it's actually what should be for every single one of us. And I believe that God has got a destination for all of us to run to. And this is a multifaceted destination. This isn't just for one aspect of your life. This is for multiple aspects of our life. And today what I want us to do is I want us to start asking ourselves and asking God, God, what is it that you have for me in my finances? God, what is the vision that you have for me in my relationships? God, what is the vision that you have for me in my career? And as we start asking God those questions, and as we start asking ourselves those questions, because a lot of us, we haven't even asked ourselves. We've just kind of gone off in life. And as we start asking those questions, I believe that God is going to bring clarity through, through speaking to you, through other people, through his word. And the more clarity that you start to get on that, listen, that is the greatest thing that can happen to your life. The clearer the finish line is for any aspect of your life, the easier it is going to be for you to run after that finish line. The, the, and the simpler it is, is going to be for you to make decisions in life to arrive at that destination point. In fact, I like to say it like this, and and I learned this from Andy Stanley, who's a great pastor in Atlanta, Georgia, about 15 years ago, and this changed my life. It, it changed Shayla's life. It kind of changed the directory, the trajectory of everything in our lives. And we simply put it like this: the clearer the vision you have, the fewer the options will be, and the easier it will be to make decisions in life. So the clearer the vision, the fewer the options, the easier the decision. That is the goal for all of us. And I think about vision kind of like a puzzle. Anybody put together puzzles as a kid? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever touched a puzzle or a puzzle piece. Okay, everybody here is qualified to talk about puzzles. What's the most important part of the puzzle? Okay, the, the edges outside, you, you guys, that, those are good answers. Like the edges, the outside, that's important. You want to know what the most important thing to putting together a puzzle is? The picture. Listen, you can go put edges together all day long, but if you don't have a picture of what the inside looks like, you're going to have a nice edge in a jacked up center. You know, it's kind of like you're going to look good on the outside, but inside is going to be jacked up. And what happens is, is, is for a lot of us, we have yet to get a clear picture for our life. Because listen, these pieces, which is a great analogy for our life, there are tons of pieces that are available for us. These don't mean a whole lot unless you have this. Because what happens is, is you, you get a piece and you're like, man, I, I like uh, blue. Blue is cool. Uh, like, I like blue. I'm going to put blue in my life. But you have no idea where to put blue if you don't have a picture of where blue is. You're just, you're throwing it in anything and you're wondering, like, why is my life not looking how I imagined it would be? Well, because we've never gotten a clear a picture. So all of a sudden, then we can't narrow down our options, which makes it harder for us to make decisions. 
But the clearer this picture is, the clearer the picture we get of what could be and should be for our lives, the, the fewer their options are because you pick up a piece and you go, that, that piece doesn't even, doesn't even fit in my puzzle. That's not a piece for my life. That's an easy decision for me to make. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to add that. I'm not going to get in that relationship. Why? Because I've got a clear vision for my life. The problem is, is most of us, we never go out and get the vision and we just run out in life. We run out in life without a vision and just just take in whatever can happen to us. Say, well, I'd like to try that. I want to do this and I want to do that. And there's nothing wrong with trying some different things, but that is, that's a that's a terrible way to try to live your life. In fact, Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, where you don't have a clear and concise picture. The people are unrestrained. The people just go out there and do whatever they want. Another version says, where there is no vision, the people perish. A lot of us are wondering, like, why are my dreams and why are my goals, why are my aspirations not coming true? Because you don't have a clear vision of what that should look like for your life. And therefore, you're just grabbing at any piece and trying to throw it in the picture of your life. And so what happens is, 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 is you're here today and you're a single adult. And, and, and being a single adult, you probably don't want to be single for the rest of your life. 15 years from now, you probably don't want to be single. You probably want to get married someday. And, and if I were to sit down with you, and this is what I would ask you, what does marriage look like? What does marriage feel like? What are your expectations in marriage? How do you think marriage should operate? And most people are not going to be able to answer those questions because they've never asked themselves those questions. And so, so therefore, because all they want is to be married, all they end up being is being married. And my hope for all of us is that as we start asking ourselves the questions of, man, I do want to be married. What does marriage look like? How does it feel? How does it taste? How does it smell? What, how should they act? Well, all of a sudden, when that gets clearer to us, when some guy comes into our life or some girl comes into our life, our options are going to get narrowed down because they're either going to fit in that picture or they're not. So therefore, we can kick them to the curb or we can continue to explore. And it's going to make the decision process so much easier for us all. Same thing is true with your finances. You, you're, you're a couple out there and you decide, you know what, I'm going to do debt-free. I'm going to get on the Dave Ramsey train. We're going to, we're going to get debt-free. We're going to live with margin in life. And, and you set out and you're doing well. You're cutting up credit cards or freezing them in the freezer under 10 pounds of ice, whatever, however you want to do that. And, and, and all of a sudden your car breaks down and it's irrefutable. Parable. And so you, you go to the dealership and, and there is a brand new shiny car that you can get payments for for $4.99. Or you can take the $5,000 that you saved up in your emergency fund and you can buy a used car and pay cash for it. And all of a sudden, because you've got a clear vision of your future, because you've been hanging out with, with Uncle Dave there and, 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 and total money makeover, you go, well, you know what? $4.99 a month is not in my vision. What's in my vision is being debt free. All of a sudden, the options get fewer. That $4.99 pretty new thing does not look very good anymore. That, that used car is all of a sudden gorgeous. My decision became easier. Listen, the clearer the options, the fewer the decisions. Oh, man. The clearer the options, the fewer the options, the easier the decision for your life. And I've learned this because my wife, uh, God bless her. She's a manipulator. Uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, she, she, she has a vision for her life. She has a vision for some things that she wants in her life. They are not in the vision for my life. Anybody, anybody if you're married, you understand this, this dilemma right here. And so, uh, but she has learned that she can wear me down at certain times in life. If you're married, you understand that as well. If you're not married, you, you, I'm going to teach you something here. And so, uh, so she has got this vision for her life that she wants a boxer puppy. And, uh, and so that's a vision for her life. So therefore, it must be a vision for my life in her mind. And so in order to try to help me get that vision, she knows that I love social media. And so over the past month or so, every day on my Instagram feed, I get something that looks like this. I get tagged in pictures and I get things like, 
TJ, see, they're not hyper. They just sleep. TJ, oh, you know you want one. TJ, how can you resist this face? TJ, come on. TJ, can we get one? Like on and on and on. And, and then, then she sends pictures and stuff that look like this. You know, she's like trying to manipulate me. Like, like how can you resist the face with a little ball? He just wants you to pick it. He's an athlete. You know, she's just, she's just trying to get me to get on it. But see, I have a clear vision for my life. My picture does not have a boxer puppy in it. I don't see a boxer puppy anywhere in here. I've been looking. Uh, actually, there might be that. No, that's a baby. Okay, there's a baby in my future, but not a boxer puppy. And so the clearer the vision, the fewer options. That's not an option for me. The decision's easy. No boxers for us, babe. And so like, we gotta know what that vision is if we're going to move forward in life. But here's the reality for all of us. All of us have a general vision for our life. If I were to ask you, you know, uh, give, me, give me the vision for your marriage. Like, all of us are going to say something, say something. Like, we're going to have words that come out of our mouth. If I say, tell me what your marriage looks like in five years, you're, you're going to tell me something. If I t- say, tell me, tell me what your kids are going to be like in five years, you're, you're, you're going to have some general idea of what your kids are going to be like. Same thing in your marriage, same thing in your finances, same thing in your career. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that as long as our view is general, it's just not very helpful. Why isn't it helpful? Because it's the clearer the vision. And if we just have a general view, like, I, I, I just want to uh, have money in the bank. Well, how much money? You got a dollar, that satisfies. You know, like, if you're not clear about that, then you're just going to settle for anything that's generally within that. It makes the decision-making process a lot harder. It gives you way more options than you should have. And so God is trying to get us to start to hone into him and go, God, what is it that you want for my life? What is it that you want to have happen? How do I veer down to discover what that general view is? And we've got to include God in the picture to get some clarity for what he wants for our life. And, and, and I'm going to come back to this, but I want to I put this, uh, uh, another little principle on top of this because it's important for us to have a clear vision for our lives. Because the clearer the vision, the fewer the options, the easier the decision. And God wants us to be able to make easy and wise choices in our life. And here's what will happen as that starts to take place in your life. What I want to do is I want to look at Nehemiah chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to Nehemiah chapter 6, I'm going to, uh, I want to illustrate another little principle that, that has been powerful for us that I think is really important if we're going to run the race that God has set before us with endurance. And uh, let me kind of give you the backstory of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a, a slave in the land of Persia. This is about 440 uh, B.C., and what has happened is, is, is uh, over 100 years prior, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, took over and decimated the Jewish people and took them back as slaves. We, we've, we've heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Those were, those were all slaves of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it's been 100 and something years past. Uh, Nehemiah has, has, is, is really... Uh, Persia, which is where he is now, has been the land that all he's known. He's never been to Jerusalem. He's never been back to Israel where his people are originally from. And he is serving uh, King Artaxerxes I as a cupbearer. And this was a very, very prominent position. This would have been a position of high influence. Not only was he like the wine taster, but he, he would have had a close relationship because he is, in essence, guarding the king's life every single meal. He's taken one for the team. And so he has a pretty intense relationship with this king. And news comes back of somebody that was traveling in the lands, checking out Persia, uh, what's happening throughout their kingdom. And news gets back to Nehemiah that Jerusalem, where his people are from, is in ruins. And the surrounding nations are taking advantage of them. They, they're building their economies on, on the, these people who are destitute and broken and without walls around their city. And then that times, to not have walls around your city means that you are susceptible to anyone that was around you. And so they're, they're kind of the, the, the whipping boys uh, of the people around them. And, and everybody else is getting rich off of their backs. And Nehemiah hears this, and he is heartbroken. 
And uh, there becomes this deep burden in his life for the city of Jerusalem. And this is an interesting thing because I truly believe that your vision in life will be birthed out of a burden that you have. Your vision, and listen, if there's no burden there, there's probably not really a vision there. Because that burden for a healthy marriage is going to drive you to really decipher what you want your marriage to look like. That burden for you to be debt-free is going to drive you to not go further and further in debt. It's going to drive you to cut up your credit cards and live in the envelope system, like like Uncle Dave would say. Like That burden is going to drive you to parent in a certain way because you want your children to grow up with these morals and these values. And so vision is always birthed out of a burden. So you better get a burden for some of those areas of your life so you can get a vision for them. And so he gets his vision and and what he does is something we probably all need to learn is that he just, instead of going, man, I need to do something about this, he prays. And he doesn't pray for like five minutes. He prays for eight years. Come on now. We get upset when God doesn't answer our prayer in five minutes. Eight years, he prays and he seeks God. God, give me clarity. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Show me how to approach the king to make this a reality of my life. And finally, after, after eight years, he approaches King Artaxerxes one day in the courts. And the, the king notices that he's down and not, not his normal self. And he goes, what's going on, man? What's, what's happening? And he goes, man, the city that my people are from is in ruins. And being a slave, he makes a huge request. Slaves don't make requests of kings. Kings tell slaves what they do. And he goes, King Artaxerxes, would you allow me to go back and examine my community? And King Artaxerxes does something better than that. Listen, and this is the cool thing about God. God always does immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Is, 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 is King Artaxerxes says, I'll do better than that. I'm going to make you governor over that area. I'm going to give you all the resources you need. I'm going to give you the people you need. I'm going to give you the teams you need. Not to just go back and check out your land, but I'm going to give you everything you need to go back to your land and build your walls. And so Nehemiah sets out, and if you've never read the book of Nehemiah, I want to encourage you to go read the book of Nehemiah. It is an incredible book on the the art of vision casting. It's an incredible book on leadership. And so Nehemiah goes out, and in a three-month period of time, man, just does incredible work, rallies of people that are broken and destitute to get a vision for what could and should be for their community. They start rebuilding these walls, and the people that are all around that have been profiting off of the, the Israelites all of a sudden are upset. They realize that their economy is about to tank, that these people that they've been taking advantage of is about to go away, that if they build these walls, they're in trouble. And so they start attacking the walls. They start doing everything they can to get Nehemiah and the Israelites off focus. And they just can't seem to do it. And they're kind of coming to their wits end. And this is where we pick up in the story in Nehemiah chapter six, starting in verse one. This is what it says. It says, now when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab, and these were the guys that were the rulers of those those areas around them. So they're the bad guys. They got got good bad guy names. Uh, It says, when Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in the H word, in the plain of Ona. And so in essence, what's happening is, is, is there's, the walls have been built up. They're getting ready to set the gates. And these guys realize, man, there's one option we have left to try to distract them from finishing this project. And that is, is we got to get Nehemiah out of there. And so they, they in essence say, hey, Nehemiah, we, we want to meet with you. We want to kind of reconcile. We, we realize that we've taken advantage of people. Let's meet together in the plain of Ono, which is in essence, which is like 20 miles away. So they're trying to lure him from the city to this place under the guise of we want to resolve the issues that we have. And this is what it says, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Here's Nehemiah on the wall. 
doing work. And imagine all of a sudden a messenger comes up and grabs the ladder that Nehemiah is working on. He shakes the ladder. He's like, hey, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah. Listen, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, they, they, they want to meet with you, right? Listen, like this is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting to get peace in the land. And so they, they've said, hey, there's, a, there's like a Starbucks down in Doral. And uh, if you would come down off the ladder, they want to meet there. They're going to buy you a coffee and everything. I mean, this is like the real deal, Nehemiah. Like this is our opportunity to reconcile here. It's, a, it's only like a 20 minute drive. Listen, if it's okay, if it's in the afternoon at like five o'clock, it might be two hours, but like it's, it's not that far away. Like, let's make this happen. And Nehemiah looks down at him and he says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I go to them? And there is an incredible, incredible, powerful moment here because Nehemiah knew exactly what God had called him to do. Nehemiah knew exactly, he had a clear vision for his life. He had a clear picture that his picture was all about, his life was all about rebuilding the wall. If it had to do with rebuilding the wall, Nehemiah was all about it. Anything that had to do with the wall, that's my work. Anything that's going to take me away from the wall, I ain't doing that. And so when they came to him and said, hey, we want to take you off, he goes, uh-uh, I'm doing a great work. Like, my great work is building the wall. My great work is running after the vision that God had set before me. And some of us, we need to get that. We need to realize that. We need to understand what that vision is because there are going to be circumstances. There are going to be opportunities in life that come before us that seem good that seem like a positive thing, that are taking us away from the great thing that God has set before me. There are going to be some opportunities that are going to come along in your marriage that are, that are going to be great opportunities. It's going to be an opportunity at work. It's going to be an opportunity with some friends that are going to start to pull you away from your spouse. And you need to grab your spouse by the hand and you need to look at them in the eyes and say, you know what? We are doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should our marriage stop while we go to that? Some of you that are parenting, listen, there's going to be opportunities that are going to, a job opportunity, other things that are going to try to pull you away from being that parent and instilling those values and the things that you want. And you need to walk into your kid's room at night while they're asleep and, and look at them and go, listen, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down from this. Why should the work stop while I get distracted by something else? Single people, man, you're going you're gonna to get an idea of what God says could be and should be for your relationship. You're going to start to get a picture of that person, and, and all of a sudden, it's going to clarify everything in life, and that person that you dumped two or three months ago is going to start to recognize what a catch you are, and they're going to start calling you, trying to distract you, and you need to look at caller ID and go, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down and hang up on those jokers. Why? Because the clearer the vision you have, the fewer the options there will be, and the easier it is going to be for you to make decisions. And when it gets fueled, when that idea of what could be gets fueled by the conviction of what should be, it's going to be a game changer for your life. And it's going to allow you to run the race that God has set before you without getting distracted, without getting pulled to the left or to the right. But you're going to run that race to the finish. So here's the practical, and I'm going to make this really fast. Here's the practical of it. How do we actually figure that out? What does that look like for us? And, and it's real simple, and it's, it's going to come back to the typical church answer, but unfortunately, it's the answer that's correct. Number one, if you're taking notes, man, you just got to pray. I don't know that that's, that's like the typical pastor like, this is what you need to do. You need to pray. But Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So here's the deal. If God's got the plan, how do you and I get the plan? Whew. Somebody's bright here. Like, if God's got the picture... What do we have to do? We have to go find God and spend time with God to get the picture. A lot of us, are, we're coming up with our own picture and we're wondering why. Why isn't this working? Because it's the wrong path. It's the wrong thing. That's not the race that God has set before you. If you want to know the race that God has set before you, he has a, he has a plan and a future and a hope for you. Like, 
In my mind, if I want to know what that is, I better go talk to the person that knows that. We better figure it out. Better seek him and and figure out what he's already said because you know what? God has already said a lot of things about your future that you're asking questions about. And and unfortunately, I get dumb questions all the time. And and, and no question is a dumb question, but some questions are dumb. I'm I'm not going to lie. Like, I'll get people, like, emailing me, Pastor TJ, listen, I, I, I've got a problem. I, I need to make a huge decision. I don't know what God's will is. And uh, so here's the deal. Like, my boyfriend asked me to move in with him. What do you think God wants me to do? Well, I don't need to tell you what that is because God already spoke right here in his word what he already thinks about that. And we're going and we're going, God, what do you want to say? He's like, I already said that like 2,000 years ago. But you won't take five minutes to go read what I've already said. Because the the continuation of the verse says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So when we start putting some desperation into our prayers, all of a sudden God starts to show up. We start to go, man, God, I'm going to do whatever it takes to hear your voice. Instead of listening to Dr. Phil and Oprah and your girlfriend who's annoying anyways, you need to start listening, open up your ears and listening to what God is saying and has already said. And you'll start to discover, man, that that vision that you have, all of a sudden some clarity starts to come to it. You start to get some details of what God wants to do in your life. And all of a sudden, you, this makes complete sense. Now I know why these opportunities have been coming before me that I didn't understand, so I've been ignoring them. Because that's the path that God wants me to take. Because the clearer the vision is, the fewer the options there are, and the easier it is for me to make that decision. And so you and I, man, we need to pray and we need to seek God with, with all of our heart. And then number two, we need to write it down. And this is one that, that I think people miss all the time. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may what? So he may what? So he may? So he may? Okay, okay. What, what did we even talk about this entire series? It's all about running, right? It's about running the race that God has set before us. So if God is going to speak the vision, then he actually gives us clarity on what to do with it. He says, write it down. Why? I don't know why. So you don't forget. You don't get distracted because what happens when you start running? You start hitting obstacles. You start coming into some difficult times, and it's really easy in those difficult moments to go, God, did you really call me to this? And you go back, what did God say? What did God say? What did he say right there? He said this and this. Oh, yeah, that's the clarity that I need to make the decisions that are necessary to get to the destination that God has set before me. Here's the other thing. When you write it down, two weeks later, when your circumstances aren't going real well and you're getting emotional and you think that God is saying something else to you that is 180 degrees different, you can go back and go, no, I'm pretty sure God said that. And God does not change his mind. He's not schizophrenic. He's not bipolar. He doesn't have multiple personalities. It's easy for us to get caught up in all the emotions of things and forget what he said, but we've got to make it plain so that as we're running, as we're tired, as we're weary, that we can look up and we can still see it. Here's the deal. It says, for the vision waits for an appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. That's important for us because when God speaks, he's not lying to you and I. He's not playing a practical joke like, ah, gotcha. I just was joking. He says, says, if it seems slow, wait for it. Surely it will come and it won't delay. Listen, 
God spoke to Shayla and I when we were 21 years old that we were going to plant a church. We live in a society today that wants everything right away. We are 30 years old, almost 31, we planted a church. It took nine years for us to craft and clarify and understand the vision that God had given us. To figure out exactly what it was. It was plant a church, and then it was, it was okay, reach these kind of people, do this way. It was continually refining it until we had a crystal clear vision where we, where we were like, man, we want to make it hard for people to go to hell by making it easy for them to go to church so we can experience, so they can know, and so they can follow Jesus. And every decision we make is based off of that vision because it's crystal clear and, and we have it written down so we don't forget it, so we don't get distracted, so we don't get off course on other things. How are we making it hard for people to go to hell? I'm making it easier for them to go to church. And as we write it down, as we get that clarity on that, we need to go and number three, tell somebody. There is power in community that we miss out on so many times because we think this is just for me. Man, community does a couple things for you that I think are really important when it comes to you running your race. One, it gives you some cheerleaders. It gives you some encouragers. It gives you some accountability. More than that, it gives you somebody to bounce that off of, and I'm not talking about anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm saying find some people that are further ahead in their journey of faith and tell them, don't tell everybody, because not everybody's going to understand what God's called you to. But the people that are further along, they understand those things, and they want to encourage you, and they want to build you up. And, and sometimes you're just having bad pizza, and you need somebody to tell you that. But they'll confirm what God is doing in your life. It's one of the reasons why we tell you to do do life with other people. Get involved in a connect group. Get involved with some people that are running after God because they'll help you discover and decipher some of the things that God is trying to do in your life. And then number four, you just got to run after it. Listen, a vision without action is just a dream. And God has called a lot of people to run races that have let them die as just dreams. So what God is calling every single one of us to do is every day take a step closer to that. Make a decision today that is drawing me closer to the very thing that God has called me to in my marriage. Drawing closer to in my friendships. Drawing me closer to in my career. Drawing me closer to in parenting. Drawing me closer to what is your vision for your relationship with God look like? Is it How are you drawing closer to that today? What are you doing to take steps towards the path and the race that God has set before? Listen, church, the clearer the vision is, the fewer their options will be, and the easier it will be to make a decision. So when life gives you opportunities and options, you'll be able to say, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Because I know the race that God has set before me, and I am running after it. Thank you for checking out Coastal Community Church. We hope that you receive hope and encouragement through this week's message. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your story at mystory at coastalcommunity.tv. We hope you enjoy the service.